This segment of WGCU's Untold Stories is underwritten by Lee County Government, County Commission, Lee Trust for Historic Preservation, and City of Fort Myers, City Council. Centuries from now, when curious historians and archaeologists sift through the rubble of our times in search of clues about who we were and how we lived, they'll look at the homes that sheltered us, the factories that employed us, the schools we attended, and the stores where we shopped, if they're still standing. All too often, these stone and wood and steel pins to southwest Florida's past are raised like sacrifices to some pagan god of the future. New structures rise only to be themselves ultimately condemned as obsolete and reduced to rubble. Certainly a lot has been lost in, in Lee County, including our local community here, individual buildings as well as almost entire districts. Um, fortunately, many communities are realizing that, that their historical resources is what gives them their uniqueness and character and sense of place. Lee County has been a challenge for those who are interested in historic preservation and uh, particularly in some of the municipalities in Lee County. Uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a challenge because the, the mindset is more to uh, tear down than it is to preserve and more to build something new rather than to occupy something that's old. Certainly we've lost uh, some to legitimate reasons and as in the sense of road widening. Other times it makes you wonder why they're not still here. By the mid 1600s, the Jamestown colony of Virginia was beginning to prosper. Puritan settlers were establishing a thriving, sophisticated city later to be called Boston. In Florida, the Spanish village at St. Augustine was already a hundred years old. Southwest Florida was inhabited by the Calusa, an ancient warrior people who lived off the water, built stilt houses on huge shell mounds, and repulsed the Spanish explorers who tried to settle here. As recently as a century ago, long after the Calusa had vanished, much of the region was still a frontier, populated by Seminole Indians, settlers, cattlemen, loggers, and planters. Cape Coral, Southwest Florida's largest and most populous city, didn't even exist until the late 1950s. But those who guard our heritage dispute the notion that Southwest Florida has a short history. There were European uh, missionaries on Mound Key before the first pilgrims stepped foot on Plymouth Rock. So our history goes back more than 100 years. Uh, it, it goes back quite a ways. European occupation, and uh, and then if you take into account the Calusa Nation, then it goes back even further. Southwest Florida, in some ways, you could say was the nation's last frontier. Uh, by the time people really moved in and settled the area in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, much of the West is already well settled. So in that sense of the European history, a lot of people think we don't have a it you could consider it a shorter history but if you look at history in its entirety with the uh, archaeological evidence the Calusa uh, the early pioneers uh, it's a very rich and long history Perhaps the most ambitious, certainly the best known historic preservation project in Southwest Florida is the Edison and Ford Winter Estates in Fort Myers, where fabled inventor Thomas Edison and his good friend, pioneer automaker Henry Ford, escaped the rigors of Northern winters. 
Nestled along the banks of the Caloosahatchee River, the site closely parallels the history of both Fort Myers and Southwest Florida. You know, an interesting thing about the estates is um, uh, Edison came here in 1885 and 1886. Uh, he built his house. 1886 is when Fort Myers became a city. So really, Edison appeared at about the time that Fort Myers began to look at itself uh, differently from just being a, a cattle town. Uh, it was the beginning of tourism in Florida. Uh, the fishing, uh, sport fishing uh, discovered South Florida. Edison discovered South Florida. So he was all part of that emergence, really, of this area, uh, thinking of itself differently. Edison discovered Fort Myers in 1885 purchased land on the Caloosahatchee and built a winter home, which he called Seminole Lodge. His friend Henry Ford bought the estate next door in 1916. Edison's widow donated the property to Fort Myers in 1947, and the city later purchased the Ford estate. Since 2006, the 20-acre-plus complex, with its eight historical buildings, research gardens, museum, laboratory, and shop, has been managed for the city by a nonprofit corporation. I've been here six years. I was hired six years ago to be, uh, do an analysis, really, of the condition of the site, and then to begin looking at which buildings uh, were critical in terms of needing immediate emergency restoration. An exhaustive study determined that decades of traffic in the humid Florida weather had taken a heavy toll on the historic property. The buildings were built in the 1885-86 uh, period, and they're wood buildings, they're wood construction buildings, and uh, the design was actually done by Edison himself. He sketched the buildings, and then an architect from Boston completed the plan. Uh, the buildings were built out of wood from New England, no, uh, no um, lumber mills here. So from, right from the get-go, the buildings uh, built out of wood, northern design, not really designed for uh, Florida climate or conditions, um, were going to have um, a lot of maintenance needed. The estimated price tag for the restoration was staggering, $10 million. The City of Fort Myers, Estate Management, and the Edison Ford Winter Estates Foundation, a separate fundraising entity, launched a fundraising campaign in 2001. Construction got underway two years later, and the restoration was completed by mid-2007. The Edison Ford Estates is the crowning jewel of our city, and in fact, uh, I'm so pleased to have been a part of uh, the decisions to raise the money and restore that home. We were able to raise over $9 million through the community, through the state, and through the city and county to be able to start restoring those homes. Restoring the Edison Ford Estates represented more than paying homage to the past. It was also seen as an important investment in Southwest Florida's future. That's a big, big uh, asset um, that we uh, have for this uh, area of Southwest Florida. We're the 10th most visited historic home in America. Um, so that gives us some visibility around the country. Uh, we generate more than $70 million a year in economic impact for Lee County. So we're a great big economic factor. We have more people visit this winter home than they have that visit his original home up in Orange, New Jersey. They all have about 60-something thousand. We have over 200-something thousand. The restoration of the Edison Ford Estates was not limited to bricks and mortar and wood. Preserving the landscape is as important um, to preserving the building and uh, maybe more important in some respects even than the building restoration because the elements of encroaching trees, uh, a predatory landscape if you would, uh, plants that shouldn't be there, uh, hurts that restoration. And you can't tell the story of the building or the site without having that landscape around it. The Edison Ford Winter Estates is just one of several historic properties owned by the city of Fort Myers, including the Burroughs and Langford Kingston homes on First Street. The Burroughs home uh, represents one of the, the most historic structures we have here in Fort Myers, dating back to 1901, over 100 years. Um, and it, it's recently gone through a, a few levels of restoration. A mold infestation closed the home to the public in 2000. But after making repairs, the city sought a nonprofit organization to operate the facility.
recently has gone through about a $1.3 million restoration to reopen the home. And so right now, uh, currently we're in a, in a position now where the home has been restored, uh, the grounds have been restored, and we're starting to resume operations here in the home. Just exactly what is it that makes a building historic and therefore worth preserving? Is it enough just to be old? The Secretary of Interior criteria, 50 years is the, is the main criteria, and then if it's of archeological significant or if historic events have taken place there, or if it's associated with historic people. Well, I think what you determine uh, is historic depends on what part of the country you're in. Um, people from from New England and, and uh, St. Augustine, places like that, would not, not consider uh, this building to be old. It was built in the, in the mid-20s. Um, so it's not old now, but if you let it be destroyed, then you're never going to have any old buildings. Preserving historic structures does not just mean celebrating classic architecture or illuminating the past lives of the rich, famous, and powerful. Often it can hold up a mirror to the values, the customs, the searing issues of the times. Well, I, I think the most important reason for preserving historic buildings is the social history associated with them. Um, a, a building is just a structure. It's a, a pile of bricks or um, uh, wood nailed together. What happened in that building? What's the significance of that structure to the history of the area? What, uh, what were the events that took place and how did those events play a role in the history of the, of the area? Uh, is why it's so important to preserve these buildings. But sometimes we cringe at the reflection we see in that mirror of social history and try to purge it from our memories, for it can also serve as a painful reminder of the dark side of the human spirit. The squat brick and concrete crematoria and rows of wooden barracks at Auschwitz-Birkenau stand today as mute witness to the unspeakable atrocities of the Third Reich and even Lee County, Florida has historic structures that are haunted by their own ghosts, like the old Atlantic Coastline Railroad Depot in Fort Myers, the one-time regional transportation hub that now houses the Southwest Florida Historical Museum. Being built in 23 at a time of segregation, it was built as a segregated building. And if you look at the old plans, uh, it's clearly stated uh, two waiting rooms. One clearly stated a white waiting room. One clearly stated a colored waiting room. There were two sets of bathrooms, two water fountains. And at the museum, uh, we still have the original pole that separated the two facilities. Um, so it represents a, a, a period of history that was real here in Fort Myers. Uh, a lot of people don't uh, associate Florida with the post-Civil War South and the, the segregation issues and the Jim Crow laws, but uh, Florida was a, a southern state and, and Fort Myers was, was a part of that history. That era, warts and all, is also reflected at the old schoolhouse in the Sanibel Historic Village. We've got that school up there that uh, colored kids went to. It's on the historical register. The, the outside of the building is, is similar to, to what it was. And it, it, it had many purposes. They used it for a church and a school. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, right in the back of the school teacher lived in the building, uh, in the back part of the, of the building. And, uh, and uh, it, uh, it, was, it was taken care of just like the, the, the white school was. But those charged with preserving our past warn against trying to expunge history's dark chapters. Uh, one of the things about history is you don't want to just forget it and brush it under the rug. Uh, I think one of the important saying is, you know, those that forget history are doomed to repeat it. So uh, as a historian and, and, and operating in these historic facilities, that's, that's one of my charges is to be able to uh, keep that history real and hopefully we can learn lessons from that. Another historic building in Fort Myers tells a different story, a story of breaking down racial barriers, not erecting them. In its heyday in the 1940s, McCollum Hall attracted some of the nation's top entertainers, including Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, and Ella Fitzgerald. It also served as a USO for black servicemen stationed in the area. It's had its prominence 
in the days of the 50s and the 40s when uh, we had uh, famous musicians to come in and entertain at that hall. So uh, age alone is not what you would look at. You would look at what did it mean to the community, what did it mean to the African Americans that lived in the neighborhoods around it, and then uh, what, does, what did it contribute to the success of our city. Complying with segregation laws of the time, a rope barrier was stretched across the dance floor separating the races, white from black. But as the evening progressed, the music got hotter and the dancers swirled faster, that rope was ignored and trampled underfoot. McCollum Hall, located over on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, um, represents a significant history, not only in the African American community, being part of that community and being an important social gathering and uh, music hall, but also to the entire history of Fort Myers because it was one of the few places uh, where integration happened even um, during those periods of segregation in Fort Myers. Music has always been one of the things that has brought people together. And the significance of that is even in a segregated Fort Myers, uh, that you had this integrated building, um, it represents a, a very important history here in Fort Myers, um, especially in the African American community. But music and laughter no longer echo through McCollum Hall, vacant and crumbling. Time may be running out on this venerable old symbol of racial harmony in a Jim Crow world. It's at a stage where if we do not do something, I'm afraid it's beyond repair. So I am continue to try to uh, raise money and to try to at least accomplish the initial acquisition of the building and then start uh, at least storing it up or restoring it to where it will not further deteriorate. McCollum Hall was, um, is in a position now where something's not done very soon, uh, it'll be in a position where restoration is not possible. One structure preservationists couldn't save was Exhibition Hall on the Caloosahatchee River. In its time, the 53-year-old structure hosted countless graduations, proms, pageants, and concerts. But it fell into disuse and disrepair with Hurricane Charlie delivering the coup de grace in 2004. The city decided that the riverfront property was too valuable to future downtown redevelopment to remain home to a derelict structure. The wrecking ball went to work. That's one where I personally felt that that facility was not historic. The exhibition hall was, in my opinion, a Quonset hut that you can find all over this country. I grew up in an Air Force community and I could have brought a hundred or so of those buildings down. So uh, to me, just because uh, Elvis Presley may have played there and a lot of people danced there, it was... Uh, it, it, they had stopped using that and maintaining, particularly maintaining it in the early 80s. They built uh, the harbor side to replace the X Hall. So I was not one of those that felt that it was worth saving. It costs money to preserve the past, and more often than not, that burden falls on taxpayers, not the private sector. That's especially true in southwest Florida with its enormous development pressures. If the public acquires it, the balance shifts uh, substantially towards preservation. Uh, it's very hard on a, for a private uh, developer to, to justify uh, preservation. The problem is compounded by the transient nature of Southwest Florida's booming population. Historic preservation is certainly more of a challenge in our area than older communities around the nation because the local people most of them are not from here, they're from other locales, and even in their local or home cities, they would not dream of tearing down many of their historic structures. So without that connectiveness to our area, it makes it more of a challenge. Despite the challenges, there have been some notable preservation success stories in Southwest Florida. The old post office and federal courthouse in Fort Myers is now home to an art center, and the city of Bonita Springs combined preservation with practicality when it acquired and renovated the old Lyles Hotel and Cottages. The idea is to maintain the, the look of it, 
and to make it a usable space. So it's, uh, it's used by my code enforcement, uh, primarily because I needed extra office space. And then the Historical Society uh, is here and they have uh, some, some exhibits and, and uh, artifacts and things like this, just like the room that we're in. Um, it, does, it does provide a little bit of a return to the community in that we don't have to go out and, and rent space. Putting down roots isn't a problem on Sanibel, certainly not for the Bailey family. In fact, the history of Sanibel and that of the Bailey family are so closely intertwined that it's just about impossible to separate them. Frank Bailey opened Bailey's General Store more than a century ago, so it seems only fitting that one of his sons should lead the fight to preserve the island community's history. My father came here in 1894, and my mother came here in 1895, and at the time, there was farming here, and, and of course there, was, there, were, there were fishermen here, and, and uh, there wasn't any Indians, you know, they'd talk about the Indians, and uh, very little tourism. Due in large measure to Bailey's tenacity and sense of place, that past lives on in a full-scale historic village not far from the municipal complex. Only one of the seven buildings is a reproduction, the rest are all original, acquired and moved to their new home. They include a cracker-style house, two cottages, the packing house, the old Bailey store, the post office, and a small cafe. The last piece of the puzzle fell into place when the old one-room Sanibel schoolhouse was acquired and moved into the historic village in 2004, a schoolhouse that Sam Bailey attended many, many years ago. Well, actually, I started in 29 and I got out in the summer of 38. I spent a lot of time in the school. Bailey made saving the old schoolhouse a personal crusade. He was concerned that uh, sooner or later it would fall into somebody's hands that didn't have the same concern as, uh, as he did, as the current Islanders had, and um, it would disappear. So the only way he felt that he could fully protect it was to have it moved into the village. But Sam Bailey didn't just put the finishing touch on Sanibel's historic village. He started it, moving the old family store onto the property as its first building. I don't think anybody would have had the patience that I did uh, to try to get it started. Now, after it got started, it was amazing of the people that fell in behind me and supported me. And uh, they knew it was a reality. Once you move that store, and of course, Bailey store has been very prominent here since uh, uh, back before the turn of the century. I could go in any one of these buildings and talk for an hour without <laughs> repeating anything. The topic of historic preservation invites a question. What does it say about a culture or a community that does not honor its past by preserving its history? I think it's a much, uh, um, it's, it's a much sadder, society um, in that I think it takes a lot of the richness you don't have the richness that you have when you have historic buildings uh, when you have art when you have parks recreation well I don't think it speaks well for the society when when people don't value their past and their and their ancestors and what what the earlier people have accomplished a society or a city or a county that that doesn't respect that history and want to preserve it, uh, I think unfortunately is, is leaving out a big part of who they are and why they're there in the first place. High-rise condos sprouted across southwest Florida like mushrooms in a cow pasture after a summer rain. In 50 years, will future preservationists be fighting to save them from the wreckers ball? To think 50 years from now of whether they will be uh, historic I would submit using the criteria that we've used that no, they will not be because of the fact that while they are important to the city of Fort Myers at this stage in its life because of the revitalization of downtown, it's not, in my opinion, part of the fabric that really brought this city together. To and what of those future historians and archeologists? How will they judge us as they examine the footprints we leave in the sands of time? Hopefully what they'll see is, is a, a community that was 
lived along a long timeline that respected the past, that built towards the future, and, and was able to make a compromise be between the two. Future archaeologists or historians may be surprised at the shift in commercialism. I think it would be the biggest single thing that you've seen in the 80s, 90s, and continuing through today. The incredible growth of shopping centers and shopping malls and American consumerism. I hope that hundreds and hundreds of years from now, that if the storm has taken us away and the water overflowed, whatever's happened, I hope that people will say these people truly were loved their community and part of their community and they gave back to their community. To purchase a copy of this and other WGCU produced programs, go to WGCU.org or call 1-888-888. 824-0030. This program was produced for the citizens of Southwest Florida by WGCU Public Media. Show your appreciation for programs like these. Become a member of WGCU, a business supporter, or leave a legacy through a state or planned gift. Call or visit our website at WGCU.org.